good friends, my good friends, my good friends. Do a little bit of everything, everything. Because it takes a bit of when everything. Do, when you only see someone on Zoom, it's like you have no concept of <laughs> how big or tall someone That's is. That's the truth. It's like, oh, I had no idea. Yeah. You, know, you won't lose sight of me in the exhibit hall. No, you won't. Or right, you're going to have to look at it a little closer. I know it okay. doesn't feel like it, but. Nope, that's fine. There you go. Like it, but you always it's one thing about people that when you we get people used to like starting to like record something right they're always like i don't i feel like i'm get. i'm like you aren't trust me you can hear yourself look at where i guess we'll look at where singers hold their mics right oh like, right up next to their i mouth. mean those mics are like 10 grand but yeah 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 this is a good setup awesome. so what's going on man it's been a long time it has been when did we meet we met we met when i was at waystar oh that's right which has yeah. been two it's been two and a half years February of 2020, so I think we got. Yes. I think we first got connected September, somewhere in somewhere Q4 2019. That sounds right. And then and then I left, and then COVID yep. hit. Yep. Yeah, I left with the grand idea of having a six-week vacation and taking my daughter on <laughs> spring break, and then yeah. COVID hit. So and a six-week <laughs> vacation <laughs> turned into six months, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's been yeah two and a half, almost three years. But you've been in RevCycle for how long? How long are we talking here? I've been in RevCycle. I first got into RevCycle in 2001 oh. when I was with Advent Health. And okay. I, was in, I was in Revenue Cycle for eight years. And then my boss, the CFO um, for the Florida Division of Advent Health, got the bright idea that I needed to go do something different and expand my my learnings and experience and he pulled me completely out of revenue cycle and had me run the finance side of the health system so accounting really? financial planning supply chain cost reporting and then i did that for two and a half years and then the senior exec was who was running revenue cycle retired and my cfo called and said listen i need you to go back to i need you to come back to revenue cycle and so that was 2011. Wait, then, did you like the others, the cost reporting and stuff? No. You know, I, I liked it. I liked it from the fact that it was a new area for me, and so I okay. was learning stuff. And I was, and I was, I was arrogant or ignorant enough to believe that I had revenue cycle figured out. <laughs> so I wanted to learn something. I got this down. Different. Yeah. Um, but I'd also prior to getting into healthcare, I'd spent 10 years in the military. So. The military oh. does, one of the things the military does phenomenally well is, um, is teach you about higher purpose, higher calling, and creating a sense of loyalty to something or 100%. someone. Right. And so my, the CFO at the time, when he asked me to come back to Revenue Cycle, um, the funny part of the story is he looked at me and he goes, you know, Jeff, at the, at the end of the day, this is, this is your decision. If you, don't, if you don't wanna come back, you don't have to come back. But I gotta tell you, if you tell me no, you're putting me in a really difficult position. So when the CFO of the organization tells you that, it's, it's like guilt trip central. It's, it's right like, yeah it's, yeah, it's my decision, but it's not really my decision, is what you're saying. <laughs> um, so I came back, so I came back to Revenue Cycle, and I actually did pick up, I did pick up some areas that I hadn't had before. I picked up more of the mid revenue cycle, case management, utilization management. Uh, we launched a CDI program. Yeah. Oh, that so was got, the era. Yeah, yeah. So, I got, so, got, so I got exposed to that and then did that for about five years, went to Cerner and ran Cerner's revenue so cycle business. So let's go back, though, because sure. I'm curious. Origin stories are some of my favorite. Yeah. So like, what's, how did you end up going to the military? Did you go right from high school, college? So ROTC, I was. what was your. No, it's. Um, what was your path? So I finished, so I finished high school. I was. I was a very young, very immature high school graduate. Sure. I, I turned I turned 17 in April and graduated high school six weeks later. Oh wow, you were young. Yeah, so go so go off to college in the fall semester. You know, 17 and a half years old. Quite honestly, didn't didn't have the work ethic, didn't have the discipline. My first semester in college at University of Central Florida, I got two Fs, two Ds, and a C. <laughs> You were like, this is great. I love yeah, partying. Yeah. And then what, like, what I, Whoa, what are these I don't, grades? I don't have to go to class. class. Um, ended up, ended oh, up with a 0.8 so zero GPA, <laughs> academic probation. 0.8. Um, That's good. And then I went back I went back in the spring, did marginally better, um, but not 
but not significantly. But to your question, so for my dad was a blue collar worker. He worked in a manufacturing plant making aluminum cans for the citrus industry in Florida. And his father had been in the military. My father was not in the military, but he had yeah. always, the only advice that my dad felt like he could give me in terms of kind of career success, professional success was go to, go to college and get a degree. And from his perspective, the best path to getting a college degree, especially from a financial standpoint, was join the military because the education benefits in the military. Now, was he paying for your college? Um, he, he was. Oh, so and, there but was back, that too. But, back, was like, but tuition rates in the state of Florida have always been that's pretty. That's true. It was pretty low. Yeah. Um, so dropped out of college, joined, joined the Air Force. Nice. And went back to college four years later, made straight A's in my undergraduate and then turned around and got my graduate degree and then got and then ultimately got out of the military after 10 years but you did a stint through college and then grad yeah. school and then after right yeah 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 i graduated i got my graduate degree my master's in business in december of 93 and then i got out of the service in july of 94. Nice. so i was working full-time and going to school full-time basically yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Got into rep cycle. <laughs> yeah, so then I, so then I, so my first job out of the military, um, I got a job as a stockbroker with Dean Witter because this is kind of, you know, I, I kind of grew up in the 80s, early 90s, so it was the heyday of Wall Street and, you know, Michael Milken oh, and yes. Ivan Bosky and Absolutely. the Wall Street movie and Greed is Good and all oh, that. Yes. And I always, yeah, you know, despite, despite all the lessons the military taught me, I wanted to, I wanted to get my, degree in finance, go work on Wall Street, make a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so I, my first job, I got a job as a stockbroker. That, la that lasted all of about nine months. And it was fundamentally different than the military, right? Because in the military, you're part of a team. Um, it's essential that you're part of the team. In the stockbroker world, you're, you're an individual. And I literally was doing the cold calling, you know, 300. Oh. Um, and we didn't have predictive dialers back like then. Boiler so you're, room. So you're keying in. <laughs> you're keying in oh, numbers, God. right? That sounds terrible. So, no, it was. And so after so after nine months, the um, the branch manager called me in and said, "Listen, <laughs> here's the deal. You can quit or I can fire you. It's your it's your choice. <laughs> but but this is your last day." Um, so all of a sudden, I woke up and I found myself, you know, with a wife and, and young daughter, um, unemployed and. Fortunately, and I, th and I think one of the big lessons from this is rela relationships matter in any, personally and professionally in any, in any, any industry. So true. Um, by sheer luck, I had been working out at the local YMCA with a guy who happened to work in the finance department for Florida, Ho back then what was Florida Hospital, Hospitals. today's the Central yeah. Florida Division of Advent Health. Um, and we had become friends over time, and they were looking for an entry-level financial analyst, and he gave my resume to his boss, and one thing led to another, and that's how I got started in healthcare. See, that's a great story. Uh -huh. That's a great story. Working so, out at the Y. Yep. And here I, and here I am. <laughs> here, 20, here I am. Years, look at, look here at, I am look 27 at years later. <laughs> all this money. Look at all this. It's amazing. It's, uh, that's uh, so funny. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, so you were at Advent for a while. Yep. And then what did you do after Advent? So then, so after 19... Well, how long were you at Advent? 20 years then? Yeah, so I was, I was, I was there for 19 years. I actually, I actually had two stints. I was, there, I was there for four years. I started in 96. Um, and then in early 2000, I got, I, got a, I got approached by the CEO of a small startup um, internet, internet company who hired me to be the, to be the VP of finance. Um, in six weeks, I started on March 1st of 20, or no, 2000, I'm sorry. March 1st of 2000, six weeks later, the NASDAQ, you know, the tech bubble burst, the NASDAQ collapsed. Oof. You know, the NASDAQ lost 50% of its market cap. E-Health stocks lost 90% of their market cap. And spent about 10 months, you know, trying to figure out what we're going to do with this thing, trying to raise more money, trying to find strategic partnerships. And then I wake up one day and... For the second time in five years, I'm, un I'm yeah, unemployed again. <laughs> right. again. Um, oh. But to my earlier point about relationships, I had I had left Advent on good terms and stayed in touch with people, and so got hired back at Advent. That's when I first got into Revenue Cycle. Spent another 15 years there, so 19 years total, and then um, and then 
early 2016, Cerner came calling. They were looking for somebody to, to run their revenue cycle business. Yeah, right. And ultimately made the decision to transition from Advent to Cerner and transition from the provider side of the industry to the business partner side of the industry. So you went to Cerner. Mm-hmm. I thought that was interesting. Um, <laughs> it, it was. I mean, we don't have to talk bad about them. I'm just like, it had to have been just no, like Cerner, such a difference. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, um, I mean, there's a difference, difference in culture, difference in decision making, difference in business model. Um, difference in focus. You know, when I was with when I was with Advent, I'd say, you know, 98 percent of my time was focused on day-to-day operations for my organization and the geographic community that we served. Then I wake up one day, and now I'm at Cerner. I'm running product strategy, business unit strategy, right. product product development, business development, client relationship management, and we've got 300 revenue cycle clients. Um, most of whom, if I'm being honest, most of whom were not satisfied with where Cerner's revenue right. cycle was. Yeah, right. Um, and so I went from from a very high performing organization with Advent Health to people with lots of problems. Yeah, to an organization that had its had its challenges, and in many cases, most of them um, self self inflicted. And so, when I mean, you've been on both sides for a long time, like. Good stints on both sides. Yeah. So I've, been, I've been on the business partner side six, <laughs> six years now. So what do you, I mean, how do you see, like, there's so many here. <laughs> so, again, it's not a shot against HMA, it's just kind of how the world is right now. Perhaps like, oh, but, like, there's so many vendors. There is. So, like, how do you, I mean, you were in the other person's shoes. Like, how do you try to balance that? Like, I feel bad. I don't even sell anything to my, my people, <laughs> my community, right? And I feel bad about texting them half the time because I'm like, I know they're busy. My, my friend yeah. Heather, you know Heather Dunn, right? Yeah. Heather and I have an ongoing running joke because I'm basically her other assistant because people will be like, they know I know her really well and they're like, hey, can you, yeah. I'm trying to get a Heather for like the last, and I go, Heather, I'm like, your answering service. She's like, God, I love it. So many people. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I've been trying, I've been meaning to get back to them. I'm like, okay. Yeah, it's, um, I think have I think for me having been on the provider side of the industry, I I knew what I wanted with my business partners, you know, from a performance standpoint, but also maybe equally if not more importantly from a service and relationship yeah. standpoint. And I've tried and now that I'm on this side of the industry, I've tried to embody, if you will, everything that I wanted from my business partners and to my earlier point, it's in a, it was going to be a common theme. At the end of the day, re- relationships matter. Um, most people do business with people that they have a relationship with. And in my opinion, the fundamental core of relationships, are, they're founded on integrity. You know, it's not, it's not enough to know somebody. You actually have to trust somebody. Um, and it's mutual. I have to, if you're a provider, I have to trust you as a provider and you have to trust me as your business partner, but it's founded on, it's founded on mutual trust, mutual respect, mutual accountability, sure. mutual expectations, et cetera. Um, because I'm very, it's not by mistake when I say business partner versus vendor. Um, because when I was a provider, I never wanted to do business with vendors. I only wanted to do business with, with business partners. And now that I'm on the business partner side of the community, now I get there's, when I talk to providers, they'll they'll be quick to point out, and they're correct that Jeff, un, until I actually do business with you, you're not my business partner. You are a vendor, and I, I and I get that. Right. But at the end of the day, it's still the objective to ultimately become a business partner. But part of that is you've got to people got to know you. They got to trust you. Um, they got to have a need. They've got they've got to have a prioritization for that need because most revenue cycle leaders are balancing. Oh five gosh. dozen balls so simultaneously, right. right? Especially coming out of the two years of COVID. Um, so there's got to be a need and there's got to be a prioritization. And quite honestly, you've got to have the ability to meet that need from a performance and value standpoint. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's like, I think, I think it's like, uh, it's a hard spot for both. It is. 
because there's gonna be pressure on you to like go make stuff happen whatever that is sales whatever you want to call it and there's gonna be but there's gonna also pressure on the other person to like try to get you know try to make improvement and it's like yeah. i think the balance is tough because if they switch out a vendor this is what i say i think is like the the hurdle of like doing something different that's let's just say i wanted to like i want to go do bad debt vendor right the old school right it's like just to switch would take how much effort even if you could give me a whole percentage like 100 basis points better it's still like oh i gotta go through the whole process it's like oh we don't want to give we have to we have to do different data files what yeah yeah i mean any i mean the reality is any any time you have a business partner at a, at a minimum you're talking about the transfer of data um and so there's 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 work effort well, hey, there's work effort required in that, and then from a revenue cycle standpoint, there's also an engagement with other people in the organization, so IT. And so it's not even about what's what's on the priority list for revenue cycle, what's on the priority list for the IT team. If it's a more invasive software deployment, whether it be a point solution or um, worse yet, a full EHR, RCM conversion, I mean, the work effort right. involved in that uh -huh. is and I think that's yeah, and I think that's and I think that's. I guess the simple thing I would say is I think it's I think it's important for providers to understand the business model for business partners, but I think it's equally and probably more important for business partners to understand the business model for revenue cycle leaders, finance leaders, provider leaders, because they don't nothing nothing works in a vacuum. And every choice you make has consequences. And I've got, I have two older daughters and I always tell them at the end of the day, life, life is about choices and consequences and it's about compromises and trade-offs. And if you're a revenue cycle leader, I think you're constantly trying to balance what are, what are, the, what are, my, what are my priorities and what are my compromises and trade-offs. And then when I finally get to a point of wanting to make a decision, what are the consequences of that decision for myself, for my team, for my organization, for my existing business partners. trade-off, right. It's comp I mean, healthcare is complicated. No, it's totally true. It's never as simple as like, I it's guess not. that is. I do have a lot of vendor friends and they always like, some of them are like, well, I, I just don't understand. They just like, I told them they could save 7 million. I'm like, I know, but like. Yeah, but it's I, also. I know what you're saying. And I agree, 100% agree with them. But I'm also like, there's also like the other factors of like, what we just talked about, like there's the IT might be saying, look, that's that's not right. happening unless you use your personal capital, you know, right. internal capital to make that happen and like push it forward. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't. I'll use I'll use Advent Health as as, a, as an example. They're they're obviously the organization I know I know the best. Um, but the idea, the idea that there's a single individual in any organization that can make a unilateral decision, that's very rarely does that exist if it exists at all. So, so the way Advent Health is structured, so once a quarter, I'm giving the keys to the kingdom to your audience in terms of Advent <laughs> Health. Um, not, to, not that this is gonna make it any easier whatsoever, but basically Ad, Advent Health has quarterly management committees across a variety of topics, rev cycle, finance, IT, compliance, etc. Typically, there's anywhere from 20 to 25 people involved in each committee. So with Revenue Cycle Committee at Advent Health, there's Revenue Cycle Leaderships, there's Regional Finance Leadership, et cetera. And at the end of the day, if it's an enterprise-wide decision, which as has, which has Advent has continued to go down this path of standardization across their sure. enterprise, basically they make, they, make four, they make decisions four times a year and there's 25 people involved in the decision. So if you're a business partner trying to so get to into that you can just make health, a switch. Correct. Like, oh yeah, I like your thing. I got to get 25 I got to convince I got to use again, use my capital. Right. To go pitch something that I have to like basically get all my other friends or as many as I can, right. <laughs> you know, invested in it. Right. It's like a uh, getting elected. Yep. <laughs> and again, if it, and if it involves and if it involves IT, guess what? There's another. There's an IT committee, and there's 25 people on that committee. Um, yes. And so, but it's but it's but a, but it's also kind of the 
I think it's the nature of healthcare from the standpoint of, you know, a lot of people talk about transforming and revolutionizing healthcare. And granted, I think there's an abundance of opportunities to do that. Um, but healthcare as an industry, we just, we just don't move fast. And I, and I might argue in many cases, nor should we, because if you think about what the essence of healthcare is, it's taking care of people. And in many cases, it's taking care of people at their greatest time of need. So the idea that you're gonna walk in and make and just make an off the cuff, instantaneous decision when it comes to patient care, no, very, very rarely does right. that happen. But I think that mindset- it's Three, five culture, years out, right? Correct. It's like, you got a plan. We're, correct. Madi and I were just talking about this. He's from Alina. We were just talking the same thing. It's like, you, we need to start thinking not in the one year budget cycle. It's like, no, the three, right. five, 10, because like, if you can't start thinking how you're gonna change make big changes, steer the ship slowly, because right. it takes a long time right. to change. Yep. Because it's not gonna, you can't do the one year, it doesn't work. No. It is It is fascinating, we're in an interesting time, like no one no one really knows what's gonna happen with volumes, or patients, no. or where they're gonna go, because like, it has been, it's, 2019's not coming back. Right. So yeah, that's, that's the it thing. Is, it that, is fascinating. That, all that, you know, that three, three year planning, five year planning that you referenced, that all, that's all based on assumptions that the world as it exists today is the world is going to be the world over the next three, five years. So you can make assumptions that then feed yeah. your plan. And then you wake up one day and the entire world is shut down due to COVID. <laughs> Guess what? All bets are off on the next three to five years. All bets are um, off. But I, think, but I think also as an industry, and I think many organizations have done this, you also then need to embrace that as an opportunity. Our plans, right. our plans are off. So right. the, the world order has changed. So now what, how, do we, how do we take advantage of this to do things differently going forward? That's where the real opportunity, and, and the speaker at the general session yesterday, you know, he's very good at highlighting it about, it's not, it's not about performing better, it's about performing differently. And so how do we, yeah. how do we kind of reinvent healthcare? Because every time, Every time I try to explain healthcare, and particularly revenue cycle, the people that don't understand <laughs> healthcare, and they look at me like I got a third eye, like this guy. I couldn't. just say finance. <laughs> exactly. I have finance, and then I say healthcare. If they know anything more, I'm like, well, right. they're like, they start asking more questions. I'm like, okay, right. well, it's like this super niche. It sounds weird. Right. I'm like, I mean, they look at me and they're like, it can't possibly work that way. And I always <laughs> tell them, listen, not only not only does it work this way, it was actually designed to work this yeah. way. And there lies the problem. Designed, right? is, it, designed is, a, is a kind yeah, design, word. Yeah, it may be. <laughs> Coddled together over this course, yeah. course of time. It's metastasized into this. <laughs> That's this a much way, better right? word. <laughs> it's a much better word. So. All right, Jeff, I'm going to do rapid fire. We're All right. Down. Uh, let's see. What's, like one what book are you there. What book are you reading these days? What's, what's on your nightstand? Um, sales. There's a book on sales success. Um, oh, look at you. Well, you know, that's me, that's <laughs> me now, I'm trying to understand it. <laughs> um, I actually tend to read a lot of magazines, National Geographic. Oh, really? I'm oh, a big, magazine. yeah, I grew, up go, I grew up going out to the national parks with my parents, and so I've always been a lover of, the, of nature and the All wild. Right, favorite national park, though, that's a good one. Um, it was Grand Canyon until I visited Yosemite, and now it's Yosemite. Absolutely beautiful. Zion is mine. Yep, also beautiful. And five times. Favorite. But I've also backpacked and done all the mm -hmm. stuff in Zion, so not just the stuff you can see from like right. the day. Right, exactly. Um, all right, uh, last show you binged and liked? Last show I binged and liked. <laughs> um, probably game, probably, actually probably, probably Breaking Bad. Oh, that's the last one. Huh? Yeah. I just Breaking finished, uh, actually on the plane here, I finished Better Call Saul, have you, have you watched yep. it? Yep, yep. Oh. So good. I have seen that, but I, I watched, haven't watched, I watched no. it as it progressed. I hadn't watched it all until like a month ago. I, and I watched I binge, all five seasons over the last like yeah. month, basically. That's great. I was like disappointed. I'm like, that's the end. You can't end like that. Yeah. So I guess there's going to be a season six. I um, think there's I think there's six more episodes coming. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, favorite vacation? De destination or yeah, what's your favorite what what would be your ideal vacation well i take um i have i have two older daughters as well as a younger daughter as well as two grandchildren we take we take a family vacation every year over fourth of july and a family vacation every year over 
uh, New Year's. Nice. And we go to different places, but those are always, as everybody gets older and everybody gets busier, it's harder and harder to stay stay in touch and stay engaged with each other. So we always dedicate two weeks a year oh, that's for nice. family vacation, yeah, eight, eight of us. Very good. Cool. Awesome. Jeff, thanks so much for the All time. Right. Thank it you was for super having fun. Me. I thanks appreciate again it. for thanks to Tagria for loaning the space. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Great group they, uh, of Tagria. Very kind, very kind of uh, them to give me some space here. But uh, great hanging out. Awesome. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. My good friends, my good friends, my good friends. Do a little bit of everything, everything. Cause it takes a bit of everything, everything. My good friends, my good friends.